Okay, I think we're at good point to get started. Um, welcome to everybody that's joining the call today. My name is Hudson Busby. I'm a solutions architect at Quack. Uh, today, I'm joined by Mike um, from Snowflake and Ed, software engineer at Notion. And we're going to be discussing how Notion uses both Quack and Snowflake to build out their ML engineering platform, and particularly the use case today, a search and ranking model. Um, a little bit of an agenda for the call. We'll talk a little bit about what Quack is as an ML platform. Um, I'll hand it off to Mike. He'll discuss Snowflake and some of their new products and features. We'll talk about how Quack integrates with Snowflake. Um, from there, I'll pass it off to Ed, who will talk about what is Notion um, and how Notion is implemented search and ranking, uh, what the previous infrastructure looked like, what some of the problems were, and how some they've solved some of those problems by integrating with Quack and Snowflake. So a little bit about Quack. Quack is a end-to-end -end machine learning ops platform. Everything from developing a model, building, training, experiment tracking, deploying inference, real-time inference, streaming, batch inference, as well as monitoring, alerting, orchestration, and scheduling, managed feature stores, managed vector stores, all in one place. With the idea that we wanted to create a platform where you didn't have to stitch together multiple different services, multiple different products, come up with a MLOps engineering team to build out a framework to integrate all these platforms together. We wanted to create a simple product where you can do everything related to machine learning development, building, and monitoring all in one place. So this is a slide that we usually show to kind of scare a little bit, but this is kind of what the, you know, the existing or the previous MLOps infrastructure looked like. Maybe you're using a notebook tool like Hex or Databricks to develop an experiment track and uh, you know, come up with the logic of the model. From there, you need a build platform, a build registry, maybe something like MLflow or SageMaker to keep track of different trainings over time, to keep track of the metrics associated with those trainings, to have a easy place to compare those metrics, to visualize them, to figure out what the best version of your model is. After training, you now need to deploy your model. Maybe it's batch, you need to figure out a scheduling platform that will execute that model or the inference. Uh, you might need a real-time and an endpoint configuring services. Maybe you're using a SageMaker or a custom-built solution for this. From there, you need to be able to actually orchestrate these pipelines to update them on a daily basis, to update them when you have new code, you need CI, CD practices. You have to introduce monitoring and alerting, keep track of your logs, maybe use a platform like Arise or a cloud metric platform. You know, from there, now that you have a few models in, in production, you start to realize that these models are using or training the same data in each of these models. You're consistently pulling in or ingesting data from the same sources, doing the same transformations. You decide that a feature store is in place. Maybe you use an open source platform like Feast or a Tekton. Um, you can quickly see that this becomes a, a mess of different services, different products that you as an ML engineering team now have to build out an SDK or build out a platform that manages all these different services and makes them usable, iteratable, and dynamic so that your team can actually continuously build onto these tools. So that's what we're trying to solve at Quack. We are taking all of these different services and putting them in one place. We have a um, workspaces, which is our managed Jupyter Notebook service that lives directly in the Quack platform. You can spin up large GPU instances, develop on, develop your models in those notebooks. From there, we have a uh, model build platform and a model registry that keeps track of all of the iterations of your models and very easily displays the metrics associated with those trainings to allow for experiment tracking. Um, from there, we have a deployment platform that does both or all three real-time batch and streaming inference and keeps track of the performance of those inference services using our model monitoring and alerting platform. We also have orchestration, scheduling, as well as managed feature store, managed vector store, and ingestion transformation pipelines that flow into both the feature store and vector store. So again, taking all these services, putting it at one platform so that you as a developer need to focus on the data science, the logic of crafting that machine learning model, and then everything else from an infrastructure standpoint can be handled or can be solved by us. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Mike and he's gonna talk a little bit about Snowflake. Thanks Hudson. Thanks everyone for being here this morning. So I'll take the next few minutes to provide an overview of Snowflake. Now, since day one, the core differentiator for Snowflake 
has been our architecture. Separating compute, what we call virtual warehouses, from the data layer, which supports both structured, semi-structured, as well as unstructured data, all wrapped in an easy to use, fully managed platform that's universal, regardless of what cloud or region you choose. It also allows portability between clouds. Next slide, please. Along with separating the compute from storage, we also separated compute from compute. This allows for near unlimited scalability. You can have multiple separate clusters operating on the same data without resource contention. This allows you to scale up as well as scale down your warehouses near instantly. You can also scale them out for workload isolation and high concurrency on demand. You only pay for the resources you use. Just like a utility, the meter spins only when the lights are on. This also allows flexibility to the use the language of your choice, whether it's Python, SQL, Java, or Scala. Next slide, please. Now the core tenants of the Snowflake platform are ease of use. Again, Snowflake is a single unified product that delivers power as well as powerful automation in an easy and accessible engine. Performance and efficiency. Snowflake can scale up and down near instantly for unparalleled efficiency, all without duplicating data. And finally, globally connected. With Snowflake, you can access data and apps across clouds and regions securely with one consistent experience. So why is Snowflake called the data cloud? It's because the platform architecture enables all of our customers to be in a global network that connects you to the data, applications, and services that are most critical for your business. So whether you're looking to break down data silos to support workloads for your internal teams and departments, or you're connecting to content across your ecosystem of partners, suppliers, vendors, and customers, or you're trying to incorporate new data and native applications from third parties in the marketplace, it's all available out of the box in the data cloud. Now, the data cloud is made up of two components, the Snowflake platform, as well as all the content, the content from thousands of data sets, including pre-built services and models, as well as complete applications that your business relies on. Now, the Snowflake marketplace offers thousands of data sets from global providers and hundreds of native applications. As a Snowflake user, you can easily consume data or apps or you can become a provider and monetize your own data and applications to thousands of prospective Snowflake customers. Next slide, please. Cool. Building and running data applications is easy on the Snowflake platform. Leveraging Snowflake as a developer framework, you get flexible and powerful ways to code directly against Snowflake using any language, again, including Python, Java, as well as using flexible compute, including containers and GPUs. We're excited to partner with Quack to enable end-to-end -end machine learning workflows powered by Snowflake data. Like Hudson outlined earlier, Quack is a powerful MLOps platform that Snowflake customers use to build, train, deploy, and monitor machine learning models, bridging the gap between data scientists and engineers. Quack's feature store has been especially popular with our customers, and we're both focused on Apache Iceberg as our joint high-performance file format for batch feature serving. For now, Quack uses a memory storage for online feature serving outside of Snowflake, but we're actively working on a future integration that will run all of Quack within Snowflake containers, improving security, performance, and efficiency. We'll have more to share next year. All right. Thank you, Mike. And then oh. finally, we've been partnering with the team at Notion for more than five years as their official data cloud. All product, operations, and financial data is processed and stored in Snowflake, supporting hundreds of users for advanced analytics. Notion began using Quack earlier this year as their feature store for Snowflake data. They also use other technology partners, such as Hex for notebooks and Fivetran for data integration. Edward? It's a privilege for Snowflake to support you and your teams at Notion, and thanks for being a customer. All 
All right, and with that, we'll pass it off to Ed and he'll tell you a little bit about Notion and how Notion is using Quack and Snowflake. Cool, cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, the mic feedback. All right, I uh, hope everyone have, is having a good day. And by this point, um, people have a good understanding of Quack and Snowflake. Uh, my name is Edward. I'm a software engineer at Notion. I work on search. And here we extensively use Quack and Snowflake to power our everyday needs. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we've done with them. First of all, what is Notion? Well, Notion is a connected workspace. Um, we enable people to do their best work by enhancing productivity and knowledge sharing within your company's teams and organizations. So in Notion, you can share documents, take notes, manage projects, and organize knowledge all within a single place. Uh, being a flexible product is great because you don't have to use and manage multiple apps. Um, but as users start using it to its full potential, the amount of information stored in the product increases exponentially. So for those of you that are familiar with products in the space, think about a single app that holds all of your Google Docs, um, your Apple Notes, Jira projects, wikis, uh, Zendesk tickets, and so on. It's a lot of information to manage within a single place. So this is where my team, the search team comes in. Uh, we want to craft a simple and clean experience for you to find the information that you're looking for so you can feel good about relying on Notion for your everyday needs. Okay, so before we dive into the more technical details on what we're doing on the team, let's take a look at the underlying data model of Notion. Um, under the hood, everything you create in Notion roughly maps to a tree of pages where pages have different ancestors and children, which are all other pages. Uh, for a more visual example, on the left here, we have the my team's homepage, where there's a section for every entry, um, every member on the team. Um, and so what that maps to in the underlying data model is that there's a page for our search team, and then under it, there's a different page for every single user. And you can kind of imagine the same for like a project board or you know, where every single project's tasks are subpages of the project, which is the page itself. So this is just to say that there are tons of pages with different traits and information. Um, and we want every single page in Notion to be searchable so you can find exactly what you need. Um, across Notion as a whole, we have almost 20 billion pages, which is a lot of information. And um, the search team, as a search team, want to get you the most re relevant results when you issue a query. Um, of course, there are not actually this many pages when you uh, for every single workspace because when you're doing a search, you're only looking for the information within your own workspace. But it's really often that when you type a query into the search box, you end up getting like hundreds or even thousands of uh, results that match the query itself, and we have to sift through all of those to get you what is important to you. So just to round things up, uh, everything in Notion is a page. There are many different kinds of pages with different kinds of information and different traits. Uh, there are lots of pages per workspace and yeah, we want to get you the most relevant information. Okay, so let's dive into uh, how search work, works at Notion. Um, by the way, from the from this point, Hudson, feel free to interrupt, uh, interrupt me if there are any questions from Q&A. Um, sure thing. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So this is Notion's search architecture roughly about a year ago. Uh, we use Elasticsearch as our search engine, which just stores a copy of the data from our source of, truth data, uh, source of truth database in a much more search efficient way. Um, our system has two main interaction paths. Uh, there is a read path, which is what happens when you issue a query. And there is a write path, which is how we keep track of uh, changes to our search, uh, which, keep track of our changes to our databases that keep our search um, engines up to date. For example, when you make a change to a search document or when you create a new uh, page, we wanna keep those things uh, updated in our search index. For today's talk, we're just gonna be focusing on the read path because we're interested in optimizing the relevancy of the results uh, when users perform a search. So, you know, when you make a search, it hits a Notion service, which contains most of our uh, business logic. And then that translates to a query that hits Elasticsearch, which comes back with a bunch of results. And then we have some heuristic that tries to determine what's the mo what's most important for you. And then we eventually render them to the user. 
Cool. <clears throat> in order to store Notion's data into Elasticsearch, uh, each Notion page is roughly converted into the format you see on the right, uh, into this object format where you have like different fields that corresponds to different elements on the page, like the title, uh, the text, uh, various metadata, like what are the answers of the page, uh, who was created by, and so on. And um, when looking at this, you might develop an intuition for what, uh, how important each of these fields are uh, when it comes to matching a document to a user's query. For example, the title field is probably a bit more important than the text field when you do a short keyword search because it's just there, it's very memorable, um, it's right there in the page. And these are kind of the exact intuitions we initially started with, uh, with some ex uh, experimentation to build our first result ranking heuristic. Um, Elasticsearch itself can compute text match scores for each of our uh, those fields, as mentioned. Uh, the final score, we initially started with a bunch of hand-tuned weights to form a combination of the scores that determined how important a result was. And we basically only had these kind of text features um, plus I think one of one of the non-texts, like something like less added at a time that helped us uh, differentiate between uh, results that have very similar scores. So this approach worked in uh, worked decently in the beginning, but it came with a bunch of limitations. Uh, for one, we always wanted to add more features. As you might imagine, there are many sources of data that can tell us about the relevancy of a page besides just the text scores. For example, you might have viewed the page recently, uh, you might be the last editor of the page, the page might have a lot of views, all these kinds of informations, or what we call features, are important in determining the uh, relevancy of a result. We're also interested in capturing more complex relationships between the features, uh, which are hard to represent with the linear nature of the Elasticsearch query. Um, as you saw earlier, the query, we kind of represent these kind of linear combinations, like two times the text match score plus five times the title match score to return the final score. But when it comes to more complicated relationships, like, oh, if your workspace is a multiplayer workspace and we want to do certain things, and in an another case, we want to do some other things, it's going to be hard to represent with the uh, just the Elasticsearch query. So we decided to introduce a proven industry solution called Learning to Rank. It's basically a supervised learning algorithm that helps us develop models for ranking results. By providing it labeled data sets, we can train a model that will understand uh, and use the features provided to intelligently rank the results. This meets our needs because it lets us iterate and add features while learning its importance in an automated way and it's also able to uh, capture more complex relationships being a uh, machine learning model than previously uh, we could. Okay, so when implementing a machine learning solution in the online system, there are roughly these four components that are needed. The first two are needed to generate the data uh, for us to produce the models and actually train the models. And the latter two are needed when we want to deploy the models and when we want to deploy these features online um, in our online system. So luckily for us at Notion, uh, two of these are already satisfied. Thanks to our data team, we have a pretty solid data logging system where we can log information through Kafka to be stored in Snowflake. And we're able to manipulate the data there, train the models, um, and we also have a cloud notebooking solution. As mentioned earlier, we use Hex, and we can use it to do feature exploration, we can engineer our features, train our models, produce the model uh, artifacts, and so on. So we're good with what's needed here. This means what's left is what's actually needed to implement and deploy these models in production, and what's needed to implement these features in production as well. So basically, we need a feature store, and we need a model serving service. Okay, so one option is definitely just to build these things in-house. Um, feature stores, uh, its core functionality is just to let you serve these kinds of information uh, in your online systems. And you might be like, why don't we just spin up some simple key value store like Redis uh, to support this? Well, 
in practice, the feature stores are actually pretty complicated to build because it's not just a simple key value store. Uh, you need some kind of abstractions over it to manage features. You need all sorts of monitoring over the feature health and the quality, um, various background jobs to uh, sync the data from its data sources into these uh, uh, online um, key value stores, whether it's batched or in a real-time fashion. Um, again, these abstractions need to be able to let us easily iterate and add additional features. And it's just a lot of additional infrastructure to manage. Same with model serving, you need to build abstractions over the bare bones infrastructure to allow for CPU and GPU serving. Um, often you need to monitor the input and output of these systems to ensure that the data that goes in and out is uh, what you expect and the model is performing as, as, as expected. Um, you also need to let us easily deploy models. You need to be able to deploy multiple versions. You might need some interesting features like shallow traffic or um, connectivity to your feature stores. And just like the standard kind of observability that comes into any kind of infrastructure systems, uh, you need to have those things set up as well. So overall, as a company of our size, we need to move fast and we need to, we need to efficiently solve the core business problems, which in this case is improving search ranking, which means obviously we're not going to be building all these different services and block ourselves from starting to solve the problems itself. So it's time to start shopping for some solutions um, uh, online. <clears throat> Uh, luckily for us, we quickly came across Quark, which has kind of everything we needed in a single platform. Um, Quark's feature platform has really nice built integrations with our existing data infrastructure. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we use Snowflake and Kafka, which this really allows us to like just easily get started with, connect to these sources, build these features. Um, their built in freedom videos also allows us to easily just spin up new features whether it's like a batched feature or real-time feature. And they came with nice observability, uh, integration to the model serving layer, and overall just provided a pretty good experience there. And similar story can be told with their uh, ML serving layer. Um, really convenient to spin up new models, has some nice built-in features like shadow traffic, auto scaling, and so on. Um, generally supported all Python compatible models and supports GPU uh, and CPU deployments out of the box. So it was a, it was a pretty easy um, uh, decision for us to just go with Quark and to um, have all the pieces in place for us to start building. So now that we have all the different pieces in place, uh, let's go into how we actually use them to implement our system in production. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the first step here is kind of to collect the label data that's needed to actually implement this and train this like learning to rank uh, system to output a uh, model that we can use. So what we actually need here is we need to log both the user interaction data, which are kind of clicks on the search results and the search result metadata, which tells us about the search result, tells us about the text that are in the results and some other information. So we can generate a data data in like the sort of format you see on the right, where you have every single result, some of its metadata, and labels, which in this case are just whether or not the user has clicked on the results, which gives us a sense of its relevancy. Um, from this point on, uh, you have the information about the search results and some of its metadata with whether how relevant the result is. And there might be some other information that's needed here that can really improve the performance of your model. For example, you might pages that are more popular might be more relevant, or if you were a recent contributor to the uh, page, that might be important for the model to understand as well. So over here in Snowflake, uh, once we have all this data there, we're able to join and just manipulate and uh, extract features, do exploration to find most meaningful information for us. And we can convert them to this kind of meaningful format below through a bunch of feature engineering using Snowflake and using Hex. Oh, so with this kind of labeled data sets, um, we get into the training phase of our uh, of the cycle. 
as anyone who works with machine learning models are probably from, familiar with this, this is a pretty iterative process. You take the data, you train and validate it, you tune some hyperparameters, you make sure that things look right, and you output some models. If they don't, you, you go back, you debug and see what's wrong, and then you repeat the process. And through this, you might uh, output a bunch of different models that are interesting to you. You might want to run an online test actually in production to see how they perform. And so this is where uh, Flux ML serving platform really comes in handy here. When we eventually output all these different variations of the models, deploying to Quark is just a really simple process. All you need to do is just specify some uh, configurations and just upload artifacts to Quark. And within like less than an hour, the, the model is ready to serve um, with uh, auto scaling enabled and a bunch of other really nice features. Um, along with that, uh, as mentioned earlier, there are like often a lot of other data sources uh, that's useful for the model to use that it's not directly just from the search results that we need to be able to compute and serve uh, in our online systems at some point. So Quark makes it really easy as well, where we can just easily um, set up a sync from Snowflake or any other data source uh, to be uploaded into Quark. All we need to do is specify some um, configurations again. And yeah, within less than an hour, the features are available available online to be queried and to be used in our ranking models. So with all that, this is kind of the current state of the search uh, read path. Um, below the dotted line, you kind of see what we mentioned earlier, how the overall system collects all the data that's needed to train the models. Um, and then once the model is done training, once the features are ready to be in use, we upload them into the feature platform, we upload the models into model serving. And then now when we make a query, we get the results from Elasticsearch, we're able to hit uh, Quark to re-rank and produce a more um, optimal and more relevant set of results for users. And yeah, overall just improve the experience for our users here. Well, cool. so with integrating Quark, with integrating Quark and using it with Snowflake, um, it really enables us to iterate on adding these new features, uh, whether it's batch or real time in a much shorter duration, often less than a couple hours. Um, once we have models that are ready, it's also really quick to just deploy, uh, experiment with new models, new model architectures, um, and just makes it a very pleasant experience working as uh, someone who works with like, uh, models and like training models and deploying these things all day. Um, and then of course, uh, increase our top line business metrics, our CTR MMR through deployment of these new ranking models, which is always, uh, which is what's the, what's the most important for us. And here in Ocean, we're pretty excited about Quark's upcoming roadmap as well. All the different things they're providing, like back their stores, managed notebooks, where we can truly take advantage of the platform more than we have before. And yeah. This concludes my section. All right, thank you, Ed. That was great. Um, I think we'll open it up to questions. Um, let me see what we got here in the chat. <laughs> um, all right, so we have one uh, coming from one of the anonymous attendees. Um, how did you measure the relevancy improvement that came with introducing the ML powered rating system versus just using the Elasticsearch uh, functionality ratings? Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, as a company as a and as a team as a whole, we have a lot of some of these top line metrics that we measure. Uh, as you can see in the slide right now, like CTR, which is the click-through rate of the results, or some other results, um, some other metrics that determine like click positions and the actions you should take um, upon visiting the results. And uh, we have experimentation platforms that we use internally where we can see, okay, what is it? What, how do users interact? What are these metrics like in our previous systems and how it changes when we deploy a uh, this new ML powered um, ranking system. So we're able to objectively kind of see that things are a lot better with using this ML powered uh, ranking system. And that's how we made the decision to uh, ship the results there, so. 
Awesome. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, one other question I had just in terms of um, when you're kind of describing how the model existed or the functionality existed before in Elasticsearch, those um, kind of like the recency metrics that you mentioned, like active on a page or just edited, um, is that something that you gained access to, I guess, once you, did you have that capability before um, just querying Elasticsearch or is that something that, I guess, with the more of the implementation of the real-time feature data, you were able to get that insight? Yeah, so some version of it was available before, some of them were not, um, but it was overall a pretty hacky process to be able to get that available, just query Elasticsearch in general, because these are not the kind of information that we store in Elasticsearch. In, the, in Elasticsearch, we store an uh, indexed format of all the real data we have that's mm -hmm. made search efficient. Um, these kind of like computed data, like how many page views it has, um, what was the pages that you recently visited, what were the things that you recently edited, they're not really available in our data source, uh, online data stores today. And so we weren't, weren't really able to use them before. And with Quark, it just makes it a lot simpler. Like once we are able to compute it in some way, either through some scheduled jobs uh, that um, exist in Snowflake or through Kafka as data source, uh, we just, yeah, just like spin up some definitions in Quark, click some buttons, and now this information is avail available to be queried online. And because of how it's integrated with the model serving layer, we can just access it uh, um, in when the models are called as well. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think it's a an interesting use case where I think, yeah, all of those metrics that you mentioned of like, yeah, just last last created at, those are, I think, probably more like traditional data engineering type metrics or BI type metrics that you'd be calculating that you wouldn't necessarily be keeping in your main source of truth for state across the application. So being able to bridge those two together to get those more valuable insights and generate better search results is a, it's a very cool implementation. Um, okay, we got a few more questions. Um, one was saying, what was the increase in top line metrics from the Elasticsearch, the ML system, if you know off the top of your hand or top of your head, but. Yeah, so um, the top line metrics actually changed a little bit over time as in what we cared about most as a team. Uh, I believe for CTR, we were able to bump it up like around like five to 7%, I would say. And same with MR. Um, basically a measure of like the ranking positions that users click. Um, just as Notion, like uh, I think initially the version of Notion search was not very easy to use and users kind of got used to um, making like information easy to find or like developing habits of how, how they search for um, information. So these kind of metrics were actually not that bad in the beginning already, but over time we were able to improve them even more. And we found that like through anecdotal like usage experience too, that people are just finding that they can find results much easier. They can get to their information that they need much faster than before. So oh, yeah. that's a that's a really interesting uh, use case as well. Just people getting used to the habits of even a slightly less performance search, but yeah. uh, your guys' platform is intuitive enough that that makes sense to me. You would just habitually get used to finding the result that might not be as great, but. Um, yeah, like for example, you, you might have a page that's like you can't really find easily, and the users will just like maybe change the the title so that it's like more unique or like add a bunch of different keywords in there. Oh, um, they can make it usable for themselves. But with all these different changes, we have a much more sophisticated understanding of like what is important to a user, much more sophisticated data that's available for us to rank these results. So they don't have to do this kind of like um, work around the poor performance as much as they used to before. Um, yeah, yeah, just providing better. Yeah, again, that's why customer feedback is valuable because you can't necessarily measure that, but the experience is improved even if the click-through rate is, eh, the click-through rate was improved, but um, the, if you, or the experience was also improved as well, which is great. Uh, one simpler question, how long did it take you to build this model feature integration? Um. As in the entire thing at the end, or just like how long it took to? Yeah, once you, I guess, moved to more of an ML approach on Quack, what was like the time that it took you to build this system? 
Um, yeah, I think I think after integrating with Quark, um, the main of the majority of the time is actually just like collecting data sets and making sure that um, the data is um, usable to actually train the models because data like in in the machine learning world, the data is kind of like the source code in in typical software engineering. If the data is wrong, you will get kind of like a garbage model when it comes out. So that is kind of like most of the time you uh, we typically spend like you know, go one or two weeks on that, make sure that things look right. Um, and then once you actually have the model, the, the training process is not that long. It just takes like um, probably like less than an hour to get the model into Quark itself and to be able to play with in our dev environments. Um, all right, we had one other interesting one that I saw, two more interesting ones that I saw. Um, does the Kafka data load directly to the feature store or do you just munge it all together in Snowflake and make basically one feature object for training. So I guess they're asking, are you, is it Kafka to feature store or Kafka to Snowflake and then Snowflake to feature store? Mm. Um, so this really depends on our freshness need for the data itself. Uh, we have some data that, so all our, all our logs kind of go through Kafka. We We just send them there and then um, we have some uh, sync job that are, that do dump them into Snowflake for uh, analytics at some point. Um, so typically, if we have a more lax requirement where we can just manage with like a batch job, we just have it in Snowflake. We munch it together and then we set up with Quark so that they sync it um, in like a batch fashion. Uh, but if we do have like a more real time use case, we I actually have connected Quark with our uh, Kafka topics themselves. And so Quark actually does like the aggregation there. So you are able to directly connect to the feature store um, from the topics and yeah, generate these real time features. Yeah, that makes sense. I think you said what it was uh, our freshness for this pipeline, right? Uh, yeah, depends on the feature. Yeah. Yeah, well, it depends on the feature. Okay. Um. This is one, all right, one last question, I think, and then we'll uh, we'll give you a break here because uh, I also had this kind of curiosity. Um, so you mentioned that the uh, when you're querying Elasticsearch, I think you said you're getting back results in the thousands starting off. Um, and I guess there's two parts to this question. So one, one uh, participant asked, isn't the search space for the documents just defined for, I guess, the documents that they own or the workspace that they're involved with? And then it's kind of an addition to that question. How does this work with, I guess, nested objects? Um, and does this give you the ability, I guess, maybe introducing the model logic to be able to going back to your, your team and then user page example, are you able to kind of see um, that nest, that second layer of nested objects? I don't know if that's those questions are necessarily connected, but uh, two thoughts that I had as well as somebody else in the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> for the first question, yeah, that's right. The search quests, you're only searching through the documents within your own space. Um, for In Elasticsearch, we actually shard and route the documents uh, depending on the kind of space, uh, workspace ID that you have. And so you don't actually have to look through the 20 billion documents that we store. Um, however, for multiplayer workspaces, you end up actually often having a lot of documents still. And so each single request does end up coming back with like hundreds or sometimes even thousands of results. Like if, if you search for like a common team uh, keyword, like, like let's say like team or like product or something, there'll be, you might have a, different people use Notion for different use cases, but in like the most sophisticated ca case where you use it for everything, you might have like all your bug tickets there, all your like um, uh, project, like, documents or of your tasks over there. So you do end up with like a lot of these results that come back. And that's what really what we're trying to solve here. We're trying to like get the most relevant results out of outside of these like the sea of um, noise that you might see. Um for the yeah for the second question. So we are able to capture that information, uh, like this kind of like nested information in the way we store our data in Elasticsearch. Uh, so we, we store data, data there in what's called like a denormalized format, which means we kind of flatten this 
relationship into um, kind of like a flat uh, abstract representation. So it might be easier if I we go back to like the slide um, where there's like a notion page that has uh, yeah back a little bit more. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, next, yeah, this page. The ancestors of it. Yeah, so this is kind of the kind of format that we convert the um, Notion data into. You can see, for example, with ancestors uh, field, it, it stores like the entire, what we call like the path to the documents. Um, you have like the workspace, you have like the team information there. Uh, and you can imagine other kinds of, uh, fields where it's like, how deep is this document? Um, and like, maybe like the title of its parents or the title of like all its parents up to that point. So we do have this kind of hierarchical information stored in like a flattened manner that lets us query for that uh, in our Elasticsearch queries. Okay, that makes, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I imagine it wasn't the entire tree of doc. Maybe it is the entire tree of documents, but that can still be quite, uh, quite heavy. Um, Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, and I wanna thank Ed and Mike for joining today and for everybody that uh, joined the call as well as participated in the in the chat because those are some great questions. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and stay tuned for more that we'll be doing in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks guys.